Good afternoon, everybody. It's so exciting to be here, and I'm just thrilled to be part of this incredible community. So one of my favorite expressions that I like to use often is, if you really want to make God laugh, just plan something. And in the summer of 1984, that's exactly where I found myself. I had made these incredibly large, grandiose plans for my life. I was holding down two jobs at the time, and the day I would go to spa lady and I would teach uh, women's health uh, with, with Nautilus and aerobics, and in the evenings I would go down to Kimber's and I would wait tables at a local seafood and steak restaurant. And that was so that I could independently maintain my own two-bedroom condominium. Because I was attending Elon College at the time, going into my senior year, with a perfect 4.0 GPA. And my goal at that time was to graduate valedictorian of my class. I had a teaching assistant's position waiting for me at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, where I would go and get my master's degree in exercise physiology. And I was also dating and soon to be engaged to probably one of the most successful young men in the community who was attending the University of Chapel Hill and um, was getting his graduate degree. So I had plans, had everything lined up just perfectly. On July 28th of 1984, it was a typical day. I was in summer school. I had studied for final exams. I went to go play tennis with my boyfriend. We went out to eat. I ate too much, which I always do. And sometime around 9 o'clock, I came down with a really bad headache and needed to go home early. Now, he came with me and made sure that I was going to be safe before he scooted home. And the police reports would show sometime around 11 PM, he left. I was asleep. At 3 o'clock in the morning on July 29th, I was awakened by a noise. There was a noise in the room with me. I felt a brush against my left arm. As I looked to the side of my bed, I noticed someone's head was crouched beside my mattress. And when I said, who is that? Who's there? A man sprang up, quickly straddled my body, pinned my arms and legs down, put a gloved hand over my mouth, and told me to shut up or he was going to kill me as he placed a knife to the side of my neck. Now, interestingly enough, this week before, I had gone for a walk with my sister, who's three years younger but taller and, and much more feisty than I am. And as women do, as sisters do, we have random conversations, you men probably know this, about things that men just don't talk about. So I asked my sister, I said, Janet, what would you do if you ever found yourself in a position where you knew you were going to be raped? Janet said, I would bite him, I would scratch him, I would spit on him, I would punch him, I would kick him, I would do everything I could to defend myself. What would you do? And I said, you know what I heard, what I understand is if you stay very calm, you have a better chance of living. And somehow that conversation came back to me in literally nanoseconds. I can remember thinking to myself, I am going to die. This is the last thing that will ever touch my body. My parents will be called in a few hours, and they'll be told to come down to the hospital and go to the morgue and look at my body and say, yep, that's Jennifer, that's our daughter. But as most people who suffer from sexual violence and post-traumatic stress syndrome will tell you, is that that very second the will to survive completely overtakes everything else. And I wanted to live. See, I wanted the sun to come up one more time. I wanted to be able to tell my parents, I love you. Thank you for everything you've ever done for me. I wanted to live. And if I lived, I wanted to remember everything about this person's face. Because I was going to make sure that he spent the rest of his days in hell over the next 20 minutes as he proceeded to rape me, destroy everything that I had built. He destroyed my soul, he broke my spirit, he ravaged my body. And in those 20 minutes, I needed to stay present. We talk about these out-of-body experiences where people say they left their body but they could see what was happening. It was really important for me to stay connected. My spirit, my body had to stay connected because I needed to know what this person looked like. See, I needed to recognize every single facial feature about him. Did he have a scar? Did he have a tattoo? Did he have a piercing? Did he have a missing tooth? What did his hair look like? What were the shape of his eyes, his mouth, his nose? Everything about his face become paramount to my surviving. 
at moments when I could glimpse at him, I would remember everything. I would burn it in my brain. I would etch it in my memory. At one point, he tried to kiss me. I can remember being so repulsed, I turned my head to the side, and he looked at me and said, relax, I'm not going to hurt you. And I remember thinking to myself at this very second, this is my moment. This will be my first moment of victory. Please, I'm afraid of knives, I told him. If you'll get off of me and, and walk down the front of my stairs and drop the knife on the hood of my car and I can hear it clink, I'll let you come back in. And he looked at me and said, you will? I had won. I had to get him off of me. I got him off of me, but I wrapped a blanket around myself long enough for me to stand close to him to gauge how tall is he? How much does he weigh? What is he wearing? What does his shoes look like? Is he pigeon-toed? Is he duck-footed? How long are his arms? Navy blue shirt, white stripes on the sleeves, dark khaki pants, canvas boat shoes. Everything was important. It meant I might live. He didn't take the knife to the front. He pretended to drop it out the front door and came back in and grabbed my arm and said, let's go. I wasn't going back in. I wouldn't go back in there. He'd have to kill me, and I knew that. I, I have to go to the bathroom. Please, can I go to the bathroom? Hurry up, he said. And as I went into the bathroom, I remember praying. I didn't know how I was going to escape. There had to be a way, and then it occurred to me. He had told me he had come through my kitchen. If I could get to the kitchen, if I could get to the back door, maybe his way in would be my way out. I'm thirsty. Could I have a drink of water first? I said, yeah, hurry up, make me a drink. We'll have a party. Okay. I got to the kitchen. I turned the light on. I knew light would be my gift that night. It would give me distance. It would give me space. It would give me time. I began to run water in the sink and ice cubes in the sink and opening drawers and cabinets as I made noise and slowly opened the door and I ran. I ran. It started to rain. The grass was slippery. I knew that if he caught me that night, I would die. I ran to the only thing I knew to run to. It was light. It was a carport. I banged on the door, and the people opened it and said, oh, my God. She's a student at the college. Let her in. And I fainted. I was immediately taken to the hospital, where a rape kit was to be performed. A very angry doctor came in. He had been awakened, and he was very hostile. They began to collect the body part, the semen, the pubic hair, the nail clippings, saliva. My body was now the crime scene. Evidence was left on me and in me. It was very important to collect this. But while I was there, I remember hearing a woman down the hall crying. It was that deep animal moaning cry. Why is she crying, I asked the detective. He said, well, she's just been raped. Was it the same man who raped me? And he said, yes, it was. See, he had left my home. He had gone less than a mile in less than an hour and crawled through her den window and punched her and bitten her and raped her. And I knew what she was feeling. I knew that rage. I knew that hate. I was so determined to make sure this monster was taken off the street. I went to the police department. I began to put together a composite sketch of the man who had just destroyed my life. All the facial features that make up who we are. He ran in the newspaper. Within hours, we got a phone call, which led to a suspect. I was asked to do a photo lineup, a physical lineup. And I saw him. I saw him. I picked him out in the photograph. I picked him out in the physical lineup. I knew who he was. I was staring in his face. He was a horrible man. He was the worst of humanity. We went to trial in January of 1985, State versus Cotton. Ronald Cotton stood trial for my rape. Ronald Cotton was found guilty. He was sentenced to life in prison in 54 years. It was an amazing day because it was triumph. See, I was the victim, and I deserved to be victored. I deserved the triumph. I deserved to celebrate. He deserved to die. He was going to go to prison for the rest of his life. We went back to the district attorney's office. We had champagne. 
to the system, I said, to the system. Life tried to move on. People told me how lucky I was, how blessed I was that I had survived. Move on, Jennifer, put it behind you, but you can't. My life was a train wreck. It was a mess. Two years later, the appellate court overturned the decision. Ronald Cotton would go back to trial. But this time, we would try both rape cases. Now, Ronald had been serving time in central prison in Raleigh, North Carolina, and had come up with this theory that he was innocent, that the right person who had committed this crime was actually serving time in the same prison as he was, a man by the name of Bobby Poole. But who's going to believe a felon, right? Who's going to believe anybody in prison? We went back to trial, and under voir dire, they brought this man in by the name of Bobby Poole. Do you recognize this man, Ms. Thompson? No, Your Honor, I've never seen him before in my life. Is the man in the courtroom today who raped you? Yes, Your Honor. It's Ronald Cotton. Ronald Cotton was found guilty, this time of two rapes, two first-degree breaking and entering, two first-degree sexual assault. Ronald Cotton was sentenced to two life sentences and 35 years. And again, we had champagne. We toasted the system because it worked. Life moved on. I got married in 1988. I got pregnant in 1989. In the spring of 1990, I gave birth to the most amazing children, Blake, Morgan, and Brittany, triplets. As I held them in my arms, it was so clear that God loved me. They were my rewards for being a good human being. And it gave me pleasure. It gave me an incredible sense of gratification that Ronald would never have this, that Ronald would never hold his child. He would never fall in love. No more birthdays, no more Christmases. Ronald Cotton was in prison for the rest of his life, and that was right, and it was good, and it was fair. And the next five years were crazy, manic chaos with these babies. I loved every second of it. And at night when I'd put these children to bed, and I would watch their little tummies go up and down and make sure they were breathing, and I would go into my bedroom, and I would say my prayers, and I would send out my energy to the universe in gratitude for all of my many blessings. And I would ask him to watch over my babies, keep them healthy. I would end my prayers every night, dear God, please, please tonight, can you have Ronald Cotton die? Please have him die. But before he leaves this earth on the way to hell, please let him know what it was like for me to suffer that night. Please let him know what it's like to lose the most important thing that we have, that is control to say, no, please don't do that to me before he dies. That was my prayer every night for five years till the spring of 1995 when I got a phone call that Ronald was still proclaiming his innocence. So he wanted a DNA test to be run just to prove that he was innocent. But come on, I knew who had done this to me. I remembered. You don't forget that type of thing. I said, run the DNA test because it's going to show what I've said all along that for the last 11 years, Ronald Cotton is a monster. He's the worst of humanity. He deserves to be where he is. He deserves to suffer. DNA test was run, and by June of 1995, they came to my house, and they stood in my kitchen. They said, Jennifer, we were wrong. It's not Ronald's DNA. It belongs to Bobby Poole. Talk about failures. I had failed everybody. I had failed me, I had failed Ronald, I had failed my family, his family, the police department, the district attorney's office, the community of Burlington, North Carolina. What was I to do? What was I to say? How do you apologize? Can you apologize? <clears throat> Two years later, I waited for Ronald outside of a church, completely inadequate how to express how sorry I was for what had happened. He came into the room, he stood in front of me, and he looked at me, and he did the one thing I could never have predicted. And he looked at me, and he said, Jennifer, I forgive you. I'm not angry at you. I don't want you to be frightened of me. I will never hurt you. I want you to be happy, and I want you to have a good life. Over the next two hours, Ronald and I traveled together on our past pain as being victims of a flawed system, as being victims of Bobby Poole. At the end of the two hours, Ronald released me. 
See, what was interesting to me is that the one person I had prayed to die would be the one person who would teach me to live. He'd be the one person who could show me that love and hate can't coexist in the same human heart, that you can't be an angry person and be a peaceful, loving person. Ronald would take me to a place where ultimately I'd be able to forgive Bobby Poole, not because Bobby Poole asked me for forgiveness. Maybe he never deserved forgiveness, but it was for me. It was to take my power back. It was to take my control back. Ronald would be my teacher. Ronald has been my guide. Ronald is one of my best friends. Please, everyone, put your hands together and welcome my best friend, Ronald Cotton. Good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be before you today. Uh, I must say, you know, the road that I traveled on many years ago has been turned around for the best. Um, but after being found guilty for a crime I did not commit, I looked at the judge and he looked down upon me and he said, Mr. Cotton, stand up, please. And I did. He said, do you have anything to say to the court? I said, yes, sir, your honor. I said, I'd like to have your permission to sing this song. He said, well, you do. And I'm going to try to sing that song now. That It was a poem that I had written when I was in prison. So just bear with me. It went something like this. It said, Decisions I can no longer make Because my future's so unknown to me And that I could no longer take uh, Cause during the day I wonder At night I heard with fear Call out his name so much And suddenly tears appear Until God came in my life Until God came in my life I was often alone and people I really couldn't face. I just didn't know what to do without God fell so out of place. And if only you could see me, then you would know how I feel. I'm not the same person I used to be. Sometimes I don't think that it's real. How many times must I say this before you agree? There's no other God who ever loved you. Not quite as much as Lord God. Believe me, everyone. Because God will change your life. And that is a fact. Because I would pray both night and day until God came into my life. And that's the song that I sung that day in court. Uh, but once the judge handed that sentence down upon me, life in 54 years, I felt like I'd been stabbed in the heart with a knife. Uh, I went back to the county jail under the escort of deputies. I packed my belongings. I wrote a letter to my family, which most of them were there every day. I had to let my hair grow so long to where I couldn't get it cut. The only thing I had to use as a comb was a fork for my meal. I plaited my hair up. I wrote a letter to the jailer. I said, sir, look, I've been locked up for a crime I did not commit. I've been tried, convicted, and sentenced. I said, I'm tired of lying here in this jail, wasting my life away. I said, so therefore, if you don't get me out of here, I'm going to start tearing this jail apart. The very next morning, three jailers come to my cell and said, Mr. Cotton, pack your belongings. I said, you're going to prison. So I was escorted downstairs, handcuffed, shackled. I was put in a cruiser, 
went to interstate, heading to Raleigh, Central Prison. He's running 95 miles per hour. I looked at the speed monitor and I said, well, if we have a wreck, I said, we're history. And so heading on down the interstate, I start began taking my hair loose with this fork that I saved from a meal. And the song came on the radio by Michael Bolton. You know, he said, tell me how am I supposed to live without you? I thought about my family, my friends, and the lady that was part of my life at that particular time. I didn't know what to do or what to say. But once we entered those gates at Central Prison in Raleigh, North Carolina, I looked up, noticed this big gate, it slid to the right. I walked in, take my belongings, they searched me for contraband, sprayed me down with crab spray, and I took a shower, I got dressed, they gave me some bed linens and a uniform to put on, and I was being escorted through the prison with my bags in my hand, yet not knowing that what may happen because I had a life in 54 year prison term. I went to a dorm, I began to make my bunk. A couple of guys come up to me and they said, Cotton, we heard about your case a while back. I said, but we're sorry, is there anything we can do? I said, just let me go, you know, leave me alone. Let me have my peace. I wasn't wanting to talk, didn't feel like it. So once I made my bunk, I laid down. There was three bunks high, I was in the middle, the guy on top, and he lied on his bunk. His mattress was that far from my face. I felt like crying, and I did sometime. But you know, my father, he came up and paid me a visit after I learned that the guy that committed this crime had entered the prison system. The only reason how I knew because I got in a fight with another inmate that disrespected me. I tried to talk to him like a man face to face. He didn't want to hear that. I did not know the alternative but to take a stand. He was into martial art, I was into boxing, but at the particular time, it didn't make no difference. I had to survive the prison system. I laid in my bunk day and night. I grabbed my pillow and I held it tight. They said man doesn't cry, but that's a lie. I shed many tears. I heard it inside because I didn't know whether I was gonna be able to, to serve this time or not. But by the grace of God, he kept me strong. I told myself, I said, he's not gonna put no more on me than I can bear. A lot of people asked me what I was in for. I told them, they said, well, you're guilty. I said, well, you can say what you want to say. I know that I'm an innocent man. I said, so you can talk till you turn blue in the face. I said, people talk about Jesus Christ, they're going to talk about me. And that's just what they did. You know, I let them talk until they put their hand on me. When they put their hand on me, I dealt with them my way. I, I didn't mean to do the things I did in prison. You know, I used to make homemade wine because I didn't rely upon my family to provide their hard-earned dollars to support me in prison. So I took it upon myself. I made wine three days a week. I sold snack bags in prison. And yet alone, you know, the prison guards that I got in good with used to bring things into prison to me to sell to make money for myself as well as them. But I kept continuing to keep my head upon that water. I wasn't about to go under. And one day my father, he came to visit, he said, Ron, he said, I know what you're telling me about this guy that's in prison for the crime you committed. I said, but dad, I said, I know too. I said, I want to kill this guy. My father, he said, Ron, he said, please don't do that. He said, because if you do, he said, you're found guilty. That's why you're going to spend the rest of your life. And so I walked away from that visit thinking just what my father had told me. I went to my bunk that night. I made me a homemade weapon about this long. I made me a handle out of a t-shirt and took me some hard plastic ink pens and melted them down to get me a grip. And I kept that weapon near me at all times, not because I was scared, because I wanted to take this guy out for having me serving time for a crime he committed that I was serving the time for. And we slept in the same dormitory. He used to walk by my bunk. He looked down at me. and. I point my finger at him, I said, when I get the opportunity, I said, you mind? I thought about it as time went by, I said, well, he's really not worth it. I said, I walked in this prison, I want to walk out. So one night, around about two o'clock in the morning, I get up out of my bunk, I walked to the bathroom, there was an open drain pipe in there. I dropped it, weapon down, I listened to it rattle until it hit the bottom. I could have easily sold it to another inmate for 
$30, $40, you know, ate many moon pies and candy bars and whatnot, but it wasn't worth that, you know. I didn't want to see anyone get hurt. And so one morning, they recommended me to go to the prison in Tennessee, and I did. And after that, my case became overturned. And the very next morning, the warden told me, Sakat, you're going home. And they came and handcuffed me, shackled me, put me out of a little car. Going down the interstate, they decided they want to stop at the McDonald's. So they go around the drive through They said, Mr. Cotton, are you eating at McDonald's lately? I said, man, come on now. I've been locked up for 11 years. <laughs> and so they said, well, let's look at the menu and tell us your order. I said, well, I looked at the menu. I said, well, I was number five in the lineup. How about a number five? That sounds good to me, you know? <laughs> and so they took me out of the car, sat at a table outside the McDonald's, finished my meal. And so they take us to Ashborough Prison Camp. I slept like a fryman that night, fully dressed, because I was ready to roll. You know, they didn't have to ring no bell. I was up before time. And so the very next morning, they put me in another cruiser, took me to the Alamance County Jail, I go in the back of the courthouse. I'm standing there in handcuffs and trying to get this female officer to take the handcuffs off because I'm no longer in the custody of the Department of Correction. I said, I'm in the county jail now. So she wouldn't take it off, but you, the you honor, you know, he got off the bench and he comes, he said, how about taking those handcuffs off Mr. Cotton? I'll give you a direct order. And she did. I changed it to my civilian clothes. I walked in the courtroom, hair after, like this here, you know, my hair grew so long. I tried to get it cut, but, you know, couldn't get a pair of clippers to go through it. By all means, I sat down beside my attorneys. The judge called the charges out. He said, Mr. Cotton, he said, you're a free man. Charges against you have been dropped. You're free to go home. And my family, my attorney families, they was all there. Everyone stood up, hugged, cried. And so when I got ready to walk out that courthouse, I stepped out to the front and I threw my arms up in there. And I said, good Lord, I said, why do I go from here? I didn't know, I was lost. It was like a newborn baby tossed out in a big world. You had to learn to crawl before you walk. And that's just what I did. I didn't mean to try to Tell my family, I don't want to live with y'all. I want to survive on my own because I knew that I needed help. I didn't want to go and live in a shelter. I wanted to be the man that I were before I went into prison. That was that strong man to take a stand, and I did. But I had to live with my sister, too. I have eight sisters and four brothers. I lived with my sister, too, and her boyfriend for like eight months. I worked two jobs. I got a job at the lab that did the DNA testing in my case. <laughs> I. <laughs> I even cooked at the Ramadi Inn restaurant. Uh, I wasn't making enough money in the lab, so I decided I want to get up on my feet. So I got another job. I had a driver's manual in prison. I studied, and so when I took my driver's test, after being released, I aced it. Purchased me a car, met my wife at the lab, we ended up getting married. We got our own place, and we brought a beautiful daughter together named Raven. She's toy up today. And then after meeting Jennifer, you know, it was a, a closure for my book that I wanted to hear her say that I'm sorry. It took her two years to come forward, but by all means, she found the grace within herself to do so. And ever since then, we have been doing just what we are doing today, traveling, telling our story, and continuing to hang in there together, you know, we like, we like a rebel band. We, we spread it. We, we get our distance, but we come back together. And that's my story. I want to thank you all. Uh, there's a book out titled Picking Cotton. If you haven't read it, heard about it, see your librarian and get it and read it. When you finish, pass it along to your friends. If you don't want to do that, tell them to get their own. <laughs> <laughs> but I thank you. You have a good one.